Just before 4 a.m. on September 27, 1977, Dolores Osborne found the body of her son Eugene outside their home on North Hill Street in Garrison. His cause of death? Smoke inhalation. It appeared to be an open and shut case with the wildfire raging at the other end of town and the asthma he'd been diagnosed with a few months prior. The town mourned and moved on while Dolores spiraled. Her husband had been killed during the Vietnam War eight years earlier, leaving her alone to raise the son whose birth he'd missed while he was on deployment overseas. Alone, Dolores moved away to live with family in Arizona, never looking back on the town where she tried to rear a family of her own. As for Garrison, all seemed well as they rebuilt and kept on with their lives. That was, until October 6th, 1987, when another young child died of smoke inhalation. Except this time, there was no wildfire nearby. Police were baffled, as were the townsfolk. Susan Foster's body was found in the morning by her parents, face down in their backyard. There was no sign of a struggle, no marks of any sort on her, and no sign of a break-in. It appeared she'd gotten up at some point in the night and walked into her backyard alone and seemingly unafraid. The deaths in Garrison repeated three more times in the same manner over the next 22 years. Following each suspicious death, the police locked down the town in an effort to catch whoever was responsible. Five deaths by smoke inhalation when no smoke was present, even separated over years, raised eyebrows. These public safety measures didn't have much effect, and the victims, always a child or teenager, continued to pile up until 2009 when suddenly, the deaths stopped. The perpetrator, the shadow man, as the town believed, was done. But was that really the case? And if he was done, why did he stop? Welcome back to Strange Trails. I'm your host, Finn Mitchell. There's a lot to unpack here with the deaths attributed to Shadow Man, not the least of which are some of the questions that immediately come to mind. Why those specific kids? Why those specific dates? Why stop? Why that method? To answer some of these, we need to find out who had access to these kids. Who had a motive? Who fits the profile of this killer, as far as age and ability go? So rather than sit around excogitating, let's jump right into the first interview. You'll recognize Keith Wilson's voice as Omari and I return to his house to have a conversation about the deaths. Thanks for having us back. Good to see you again, Finn. Omari. So the, uh, the true enigma of Shadow Man, this is what I want to focus on. He's built up in the town as this cunning serial killer. Can you walk us through the victims that he allegedly killed and what your experience was with this case while you were on the force? There have been a total of five murders attributed to Shadow Man. Plus the two that burned in the fire. Well, we don't know that he killed them. There was no evidence of foul play in their deaths apart from the fact that they were running. So the deaths that are officially linked to him, the dates seem strange to me. They start out a full decade apart and then by the end, they're only six years apart. There's not even much of a pattern. It starts in September, then October, back to September, May, and then July. This isn't an anniversary situation. They're just happening on these random days. Is there any insight into why they might have happened when they did? Because as far as I can tell, there were no town events scheduled around those dates. Nothing of significance. Never, I never got those answers myself, so I can't help you with that. All of this has stumped me for decades. I started as an officer just about a month before the second death happened back in 1987. At that point, we thought we'd moved on from the craziness of the night almost a decade prior, and we treated the stories the children were telling as just stories. Shadow Man was the town's boogeyman, and that was what we accepted because he kept the kids in line. Nobody gave him a second thought until Susan died. She was, oh, 10 or 11, a little bit older than Eugene. Her mom checked the yard and saw her first. I was one of the ones that responded to the call. Did you notice anything odd when you got there? Apart from the manner of death, there wasn't. 
just seemed like an accident somehow. But it struck something in me, because for a couple of years after Eugene's death, Mrs. Osborne would call and assist the police open an investigation into how he died. She was certain he'd been murdered. All of this was before my time. But with no evidence pointing to foul play, they couldn't do anything. And as she continued, the officers got sick of her and started outright dismissing her ideas, and then ultimately her as a, a crazy bitch. Eventually, she got fed up and chose to leave Garrison. She wanted nothing to do with this place anymore, and in her shoes, I might have done the same thing. Because the reason she kept insisting Eugene had been murdered was that she found him outside that night. And according to her, he, quote, would never leave the house without her. He should never have been in the yard on his own, especially at that time of night. She was certain someone had taken him in either a kidnapping gone wrong or just an opportunistic killing. But there was no mention of any signs of struggle in the articles I read about it. Exactly. And that's why they brushed her off. He had asthma. There was smoke in the air. And most people were outside that night frantically trying to leave town. Him being out there actually made sense. So the police, case closed. But when Susan's body turned up, and she died the same way, outside, with no apparent signs of distress, no scratches or messed up hair or anything like that, it reminded me of what people had said about Eugene. And that's when I started looking into it. The town treated Susan's death as a freak accident, which at the time it definitely appeared to be, though I had suspicions that were growing. So I carried out my own investigation. And you know what I found? Hmm. Nothing. No witnesses, no one overheard anything or saw any figure in the yard, nothing. So I couldn't make any headway with solving her death. She stayed in the system as a closed case. So with no witnesses to Susan's death, it was difficult to even be sure it was a murder. I get that. But what about with Eugene? From what you know, what was the timeline of his death? He was found after the town had been awoken by the fire. I was there, I remember the night. Parents were grabbing their kids, running to their cars, and trying to leave town, get as far away from the fire as possible. People were screaming, children were crying. It was mayhem. But through the screaming, Dolores managed to catch the attention of a couple families while she tried to resuscitate her son. In the moment, everyone thought something had gone wrong inside the house and she dragged him out into the yard. It only came out later that she found him out there. So nobody suspected foul play at the time. My family was trying to leave and they drove right by the house. We pulled over because there was a small crowd on our lawn, and my dad wanted to know if he could help. While he went out there, I had an experience. What kind of experience? I do think I saw Shadow Man that night. Wait, where? It was after my mom ran out of the car to join my dad on the Osborne's lawn. I was in the back seat watching the crowd, unsure what exactly was happening there. When I looked up, and there on the roof, I saw a figure. Dark, shadowy, very difficult to see in the lighting. Just got lucky it was so close to a full moon. On the roof? Like in the movie Sun? No, uh, not like that. But he was on the roof. Did you tell anybody about what you saw? I didn't have to. Once I got to hanging out with my friends again, everyone had already started talking about the Shadow Man. I think a lot of them were making stories up to fit in. But it seemed whatever I had seen wasn't a fluke. Did you at least tell your parents? Well, I looked down to check on what was happening, and when I looked back up, he was gone. I couldn't see him anymore. Did you ever see him again? Once or twice, yeah. And what were those encounters like? Nothing special. He never got close enough for me to see any real detail. And I never saw him when I was with someone else who could corroborate my story. He never attacked you? You never saw him on one of the anniversaries? No, whenever I saw him, it felt like he was just watching. So why do you think he killed the kids? I think they had something he wanted. And what would that be? If I knew, I would have been able to protect them. When you were investigating this, who did you look into? A lot of different people came up over the years. All of the parents were first on the list once we realized these were murdered. And we started looking into who had access to the kids leading up to their deaths. Everyone that we looked into came back clean. Actually, I had a friend who still works on the department pull a couple strings for me. I have a little present for you. Keith leaned over and picked up a shoebox that was sitting on the ground next to his chair. When he lifted the lid, well, you'll hear. <gasps> Are all of those... The crime scene pictures, yep. 
There were none from the first two because no one treated them as murders. But Karen Cirillo in 96 onward, we have records of. We spent a little bit of time laying them out on Keith's kitchen table until it was covered completely in different angles of the victims' bodies. They're all so young. The oldest was Karen in 96. She was 15. Oh my God. 2003 was Nicole Taylor. She was just eight. And in 2009 was... Madison Cook, age 10. It's hard to describe how something like that tableau looked. To see these dead children just out there, their lives cut short. All of them had been found in their yards face down. Karen was... she'd thrown up on herself. Half-digested cookies clinging to the front of her nightgown. Keith's assessment was that she'd eaten just before it happened. Maybe she'd come downstairs for a midnight snack when Shadow Man did what he did. Even in that moment, they assumed she'd somehow ingested poison. Until after the autopsy, when it was clear from the burns inside her lungs, how she died. Her death sent the town into a panic. That was three identical deaths, all happening around the same time, a decade apart, in the same place. They knew something was going on, and they looked to the police to stop it. After Karen in 1996, we planned on doing curfews during September and October every decade. It wasn't ideal, but it was the only option we had since there were no leads on who Shadow Man might be. And we had no idea what night he'd strike. So that's what confuses me, is that he's been all over the town and so many people have seen him, yet seemingly no one has actually seen him. How is there no suspect? There were suspects, like I mentioned. But none of them got you anywhere. You didn't have a single person of interest that you never could totally clear? I'm not going to put somebody away for something they didn't do just because the town wants to feel justice is served. What good would that do if we pulled someone in on circumstantial evidence and then the murders continued? How much of an innocent person's life would be wasted in that pursuit? All right, but if you had to guess somebody, what names come to mind? I'm not doing this. Why not? I just told you. Whoever is Shadow Man has done a good enough job to cover their tracks and avoid suspicion. We're going to leave it at that. But that's what this whole thing is. I'm here trying to figure out who Shadow Man actually is, who's terrorizing the town. And the easiest way for me to do that is to follow up on whatever leads you've had that you didn't get to fully explore. I'm not sure where his vitriol came from. It was so different from how he'd acted the entire rest of the time we'd spoken. Even when he was being grilled by Omari for killing Isaac, he'd stayed pretty calm. And upon further thought, Keith had no problem throwing Walter Lee under the bus with regards to who may have taken Margaret from her home. He couldn't prove it, but he was fine with tossing that name out for everyone to think about. So, it was strange to see this chip in his demeanor. And we'll leave it at that. Finn, look at these pictures. Mm -hmm. What does that look like to you? Omari held up three pictures. Two of Nicole's crime scene from 2003, and one from Madison's in 2009. There, in the corner of, uh... Wait, who's this? Yeah, Nicole's picture. Look. Oh, whoa! And look, you can sort of see it from this other angle, too. What do you see? Right there. You see that footprint? It had rained that night. That's why her clothes are completely soaked through. Somebody stepped in mud. Barefoot? Let me see that. Mm, I don't know. It's tough because it's only in these two pictures and it's so far away I can't really make out any more details than the dark shape. Okay. And this one? Also kind of far away. And I don't know that it's going to help anyway. It's not as if we have a database of everybody's foot from this area. But the blackened footprint is something Ava saw before Madison was killed. He was following her? Or leading her somewhere. We don't know. Well, hopefully that wasn't a kidnapping attempt. Well, you never know around here. People just up and vanish sometimes. How do you mean? You get a runaway every so often. I'm sorry, are you saying Jordan Harris, who went missing two days ago at this point, and is 19 years old, ran away from home? Why would he do that? Or did Shadow Man do something? I don't think that's what happened. I don't know what's going on in Jordan's head, but Shadow Man kills in a very specific way. We've never seen him do things like kidnapping. Who's we? We, the town. Shadow Man isn't a kidnapper. So Margaret Lee wasn't kidnapped? We've been through this. Her dad is the most likely suspect. But you don't know that, though. 
Shadow Man could have kidnapped Jordan and some of the other people you assume are runaways while also murdering others on whatever fucking day. You're not in his head. So, Omari is, um, Jordan was his friend, and he's missing now. I was listening back through the interview we had with him, and at one point he mentioned hearing a noise in his house that him and his father never got an explanation for. Something big fell, or whatever, and they searched all the rooms, including the basement, but found nothing. Nothing had been knocked over, no sign of forced entry. But after he went missing, it crossed my mind that they never checked the attic. So is it possible that a person, maybe Shadow Man, had been up there, waiting for an opportunity to take him? I guess it's possible. It just doesn't seem likely. There's no evidence that Shadow Man kidnaps people. Well, what evidence is there that he's the one killing them? Who else would be killing them the same way every few years from when Shadow Man was first seen? And who else would be kidnapping people who have no reason to run away? We didn't get much further with Keith, so we left soon after. He had worked on the force for decades, so it's possible over those years he'd picked up a sort of gut instinct about things. And maybe he knew more than he was letting on. But it definitely struck both Omari and me as odd that he was so certain Shadow Man hadn't acted as a kidnapper. Powering forward, Omari and I met up with Ava, as I'd been hoping to get her perspective on the deaths attributed to Shadow Man. We arrived at her house a couple hours after leaving Keith's, ready to delve into her experience following Madison's death. They're dairy free. Oh, she doesn't want you to get the shits. Okay, I can take a pill, but thank you. I've never made cookies like this before. I hope they taste all right. Yeah, I'm sure they're great. Try one. Ah, uh, you too. Get them one. Well, I won't be able to talk with my mouth full. Been there. Oh. <laughs> okay, Omari, um, you take over for a minute. So we just left Keith's house. Okay. He told us what the murders were like working as an officer. Mm. Damn, you do a good job on these. Mm, thank you. So my question is, all this stuff was happening regularly, and everyone didn't just move out of the area? Well, it took a while for people to get the regularly part of that. Once a decade isn't exactly that often, so then, even with what I would consider to be overwhelming evidence, people just don't think it's what it looks like. What it looks like? A serial killer. What do they think it was, if not that? Coincidence? Coincidence? Well, you know how people can be, especially when you're in these rural areas. Well, not in the face of this. People are seeing them all over town. And people still don't vaccinate their children. People think climate change isn't real. Overwhelming evidence seems to just push some people away from that consensus. Insane. You can ask them about it. We really can't, though. And most of the people around here clam up anytime Finn mentions Shadow Man. We have to build trust with them first, especially considering what a strange situation this was. The killings were... I mean, how many people die of smoke inhalation in a year? It can't be that many. From the research I've done, smoke inhalation deaths get mixed in with burning deaths, so it's impossible to know the exact number. But those deaths combined come to roughly 3,300 people a year. And it's this. I don't know how to describe it. I'm the one that found her. Madison. Just uh, in the yard. And that type of death, uh, smoke inhalation. She was face down in the grass. I didn't know she was dead. And the only reason it even crossed my mind she might be was because the whole town had been talking about it. Uh, but I mean, it's really messed up, but kids then on the playground, it was almost like, like a joke, I guess. They play dead that way. What? So Shadow Man tag, is that what it was? No. Uh, well, yes. But this was a separate thing. This was more of, like, I don't want to say a prank, but in that vein. No, this town's pretty fucked up. Yeah, you're telling me. So you you thought Madison was just joking, essentially. Is that what you're saying? Until I flipped her over and I saw her, her bloodshot eyes. My dad almost knocked me over trying to get to her to perform CPR, but it was... When I rolled her over, she was just stiff and so cold. Like she'd been out there a little while. Like, hours at least, and no one hurt her in the infinite. I'm sorry, I just... Hey, yeah, take your time. Take your time. (sighs) 
every year, I hope the anniversary gets easier, but it doesn't. I'm glad he stopped after Madison. I just wish he'd been stopped earlier. Why do you think he stopped after her? Got old, maybe. Died, hopefully. Because I've been, I've been thinking... That's dangerous. Well, it's based on something you said, Omari. Which was? Well, just a couple minutes ago, you said, why didn't people move out? I mean, that'd be my first response if they're the serial killer in my hometown. Well, you're right. Did people move away, Ava? Some people did over the years, but I think you've noticed just how stubborn this town can be. They're not going anywhere over one death every decade. Hmm. An idea had taken hold, so I pulled out my computer and the three of us spent the next few hours doing some research. It turned out that Ava was right about smoke inhalation deaths being relatively low, compared at least, to other types we looked up, which made it easier when we narrowed down the deaths by date. Shadow Man took all of his victims progressively closer, except for the decade following Madison Cook's death when Garrison braced itself for an impact that never came. It seemed, at the time, that the torment was over. But what if it wasn't? What if the body everyone had been so scared to find that year did turn up? It just wasn't where they expected it. After searching and comparing information, the three of us reached a conclusion. On April 9th, 2012, 13 people were recorded as dying either of burns or smoke inhalation. Eight of them were adults, and therefore not Shadow Man's target age. Two were a pair of toddlers, unfortunately killed in a house fire. He doesn't ever seem to take two victims at a time, so they were unlikely to be a part of his spree. One was a teenager in a car crash. The flames and the smoke, it seems, had just overwhelmed him while he was unconscious, and Shadow Man doesn't seem to injure people like that. A little girl fell into a bonfire at a sleepaway camp, and a few hours later ended up succumbing to the third-degree burns she sustained. Her family sued the camp, and won a huge settlement years after the fact. And that left the 13th death. One blurb in an article out of a suburb near Minneapolis, quote, Zachary Scott, age 15, was found outside his home yesterday morning by his father, David Scott. The boy had died of apparent smoke inhalation from an unknown source. End quote. But it gets stranger. David Scott, it turns out, used to be classmates with Ava's mother. She pulled out her yearbook and showed us the class picture where she was sitting just a couple students away from him on the school bleachers. He moved to Minneapolis in 1987 after growing up in Garrison and graduating high school. A lot about this death screamed Shadow Man. Same type of death to somebody from Garrison. Though, something about the date felt weird. It was barely three years after Madison's death, nearly halving the time between murders rather than slowly decreasing the year count. But what was especially disturbing about finding out about Zachary was what it implied. Zachary Scott had never lived in Garrison. His death meant that Shadow Man wasn't just terrorizing the town. He was after specific people, regardless of if they were in the area or not. Running away wouldn't save them. I knew immediately I had to talk to David, and I was ready to book a flight to Minneapolis that evening if it meant we'd be able to interview him. Luckily, Omari stepped in to point out we were already stretching our tight budget just by being out in garrison. There wasn't much room for a round-trip flight halfway across the country, which is a shame because I had prime seats picked out for a flight to Eau Claire. So, at his and Ava's suggestion, I settled for a video call. Ava's lovely mother, Sharon, reached out to David, and he agreed to be interviewed the following day. Here's what he had to say. Thanks for joining us, David. Of course. I want to just get right to the point of this. So you moved away from Garrison? Yes, in uh, 1987. Okay, and what prompted that? A lot of people move away from their hometowns. Did it have anything to do with the murders? Mm, not really. Of course, I wouldn't want to raise a child in a place where that happens. But at that point, there had only been three deaths. That wasn't at the forefront of my mind. There were more opportunities out in Minneapolis, and that's all. Did you ever see Shadow Man when you lived in Garrison? Plenty of times. Oh, most people only saw him once or twice. Hmm. I mean, it felt like he was watching me a lot. 
especially when I was younger. Uh, I don't know. This is gonna sound weird, but uh, I look at myself as being very, uh, very aware of my surroundings. So all the times I saw Shadow Man, I don't think he meant to be seen. So you've got him figured out? No, absolutely not. What I mean is, I think he's been watching everybody. And I just noticed. Do you feel like he targeted you then? Or Zachary? Hmm. I don't know why he did it. Maybe it was because I tried to get away. But other people have moved away too. And Zachary had only ever been in garrison to visit his grandma. It doesn't make sense. The only thing I can think of is that Zachary and I both had an identical experience with Shadow Man uh, years apart. In Garrison? Yeah, yeah. For me, it was back in the 80s when I was just about to graduate high school. And for him, it was the night before he died. What happened? I don't remember the exact time, but it had to be almost the same. Late at night for both of us. I was in my room listening to my Walkman while I finished up my math homework. Always used to put it off because I was terrible at it. Zachary had the same issue. <laughs> but the song ended, and before the next one began, I could faintly hear a baby crying. I left my bed, opened the blinds, and then had to open the window because I couldn't see out with the lights on in my room. Nothing was out there. And the crying faded away. So I closed the window, and in the reflection, I saw somebody in my doorway. When I turned around, maybe a half second later, nobody was there. I'm not much of a fighter, but fight or flight kicked in and my body chose fight. I ran out of my room, ready to tackle the guy. It had to be a guy. He was so tall, completely filled the doorway, but no one was in the hallway. I ran downstairs trying to catch up with him when I heard the door into the garage open. All the lights were off downstairs. I was home alone, so I grabbed the first thing my hand found along the wall. It was a heavy vase my mom had on an end table. I heard over there where the garage entrance was just as the lights turned on. It was my parents back from their date night, surprised to see me with the vase. You tell them what had happened? Shadow man was here. Didn't really sit well with them because any of the other times I tried to point him out to them, they never saw him. They wouldn't let me call the police even though I wanted to. Was there any sign of a break-in? No, no. But when I got back to my room, the window was open again. I think Shadow Man hid in an upstairs room while I ran downstairs and then snuck out. Hmm. And were there any footprints or anything like that? That's very specific. How did you know about those? You saw them? Uh, just growing up, I saw them every once in a while. Usually in the forest, there were these, uh, I don't know how to describe them. It was like someone had just walked on coals and their feet were singeing the ground with each step. Did you ever follow them? I'm sure at one point I did. And did they lead anywhere specific? I felt like the, I feel like they just led me in circles. I don't really remember. If they did, it wasn't anywhere that made an impact. And Zachary, did he ever bring any of this up with you? The only time he mentioned seeing Shadow Man was the night before we left Garrison that year. We were in town for Easter visiting my mom for a few days. He knew about Shadow Man, obviously, and had asked about him in the past, but it was always just a story to him. That was until Easter night. I went to a get-together with some old uh, high school buddies at the Tankard. That bar is still there, right? Across from Stanley's Diner? Yeah. While I was there, one of my friends told me they'd seen Zachary out and about town earlier in that day. I thought they were just mentioning it in the passing, but they started asking if I knew where he'd been. I didn't know. Uh, he was 15. I mean, I let him do his own thing. And that's when he told me... Sorry, who is he? Kevin Wright. He said he'd kept an eye on Zachary. What a creep. <laughs> well, it's a small town, and he didn't recognize the boy, so we watched him and followed him for a bit. I'm sure you guys have dealt with this. He didn't have anything better to do with his time on Easter? I think, uh, I think he was on the way home from church to a family gathering, if I remember correctly. Anyway... He watched Zachary go into the forest and then started hiking off the trail toward, uh, toward, that, uh, toward that clearing is. Oh, the one with the obsidian and the salt, right? Exactly, exactly. He lost track of Zachary and the trees and left to see his, uh, you know, his family. And you talked to Zachary about this afterward. I honestly forgot about it. 
because when I got home, as soon as I walked in the door, he ran to me and hugged me tight, bawling his eyes out. It took a while to get him to calm down enough to be able to explain in more than sentence fragments what he'd seen. He hadn't cried in front of me since he was seven. And eventually, as he started telling me, I had this weird sense of deja vu because his story was so similar to mine all these years ago. He'd been cooking and listening to his iPod in the kitchen. And as the song ended, he heard a baby crying. He opened the blinds to try to look out right there. And the reflection was the figure filling the whole doorway into the room. When he turned around, no one was there. But he was so shocked, he dropped his mixing bowl. Totally covered himself in flour and salt and milk. Something about the experience shook him up so much, he started crying. And that was when I'd arrived home. It was the same situation. And it wasn't his grandma he saw? No, oh, no, no. She was in bed. Had been for hours. Dropping the bowl woke her up, though, and she came downstairs. I told both of them to stay down in the dining room while I checked the house. Every other room was empty, even the closets. When I went back down, I popped my head in to see uh, the mess in the kitchen. The fucking window was wide open. We didn't spend our final night there. We got a motel back in town for my mom, and the two of us started heading back to Minneapolis. And why not go to the police that night? I did. It felt like a formality. They had no expectations of catching the guy. And it didn't help that Zachary could only describe him the same way everyone else had. Tall man, dark and shadowy. No distinguishing features beyond that. He tried. He wanted to help so badly. He kept drawing pictures, hoping something, something would help the police. God, he was a good kid. For having turned 15 just about a week earlier, I couldn't have asked for better. It caused trouble sometimes, but deep down, if I ever see the son of a bitch who took my son, he's got another thing coming. So, so after Zachary's death then, why not talk to the police at that point? They said it was smoke inhalation that killed him, and you know it wasn't. I don't know what it was. I know Shadow Man did it. So why not tell them? I did. They ignored me. You know who else ignored me? The FBI. Nothing ever came of it. Even after I told them about the linked garrison. Because there's nothing to point to where I can say for sure it's murder. I don't understand why the FBI wouldn't do something about this information. Well, it comes down to what can realistically come out of that. There's nothing to help solve the case, and the crime scene is gone at this point. But they could have stepped in way sooner. They never even interviewed you? Oh, they asked a few questions, but I never got any follow-up. As far as I know, they forgot about the case. No, oh, Shadow Man did what he did, and I hope someday he fucking pays. But as for Zachary, I want him to just rest in peace. I couldn't argue with the wishes of a grieving father. So I let him go. When it came down to it, David wanted to move on from the experience, but he made it clear Zachary was the only kid he'd ever have. There was no replacing him with a new child. This was a hole in his life he insisted on keeping forever. Those two thoughts feel contradictory to me, but that's where he was at. I asked him if he had any pictures of Zachary I could see, so we could try to determine if there were any other commonalities among the victims. He sent me one of Zachary at a park near Minneapolis. It showed me a happy boy, 12 at the time, according to David, out on a dock, about to begin a day-long fishing trip. He was a normal, bespectacled, skinny, pale white kid with tousled, dirty blonde hair and braces. Nothing remarkable about him. No distinguishing features that might explain why Shadow Man chose to chase him down rather than sticking with any of the other almost identical children in Garrison. But finding pictures of the victims became the next project. Maybe if we could see all of them together, it would reveal a piece of the puzzle we were missing. So while Omari and I had been talking to David, Ava spoke with some of the victims' families to get pictures for us to study. She didn't have a whole lot of success, but she did come up with an idea that could get us around the issue. So how many pictures did you get? That's the thing, I've got pictures of Madison. Thank you. Of course. And then I tried talking to Nicole Taylor's parents. She's the one from 2003. 
they really didn't want to talk to me at first. Then they opened up a little bit after I told them who I was. Still want to give you any pictures, though? Fortunately. Damn. It's okay. I thought of something. Remember my mom showed us the yearbook yesterday? Mm-hmm. Well, it got me thinking. The school must have yearbooks going all the way back to 1977. They'd have everybody's picture. Oh, do you think they'd let us take a look at those? I gave them a call, actually, and... And? Secretary Garrison Elementary is Mrs. Robinson. When I was growing up, she was my neighbor. Ooh. I asked if I could see the yearbooks for a project we're doing, and she said yes. Awesome. Yeah. Is that where we're heading right now? It is. Take the next left. So what'd you learn from your interview, Finn? I don't know, really. All I know is the murder happened in 2012, so everyone around here who thinks Shadow Man is done is working with incorrect information. Hmm. And if the murders are going to happen again, they're going to happen at some point soon. This town is overdue, and then this goes from cold case to hot pursuit. For the police? Yeah, yeah, sure. You can't be chasing a serial killer. Well, I mean, obviously I wouldn't talk. Whoa, 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 look! There it is again! There what is? You mean that van? Follow it! We have somewhere to be. That white one? Why do you want to follow it? We've seen it all over town. We never managed to see who the driver is. Do you know who owns it? Huh, I hadn't really been paying attention to it. Definitely new around here, though. See? So what am I doing? Catch up! Follow it! Careful. Not so fast. The police love catching speeders through here. Well, don't lose it. Doing my best here. Wait, no! You can make that! Don't slow down! I'm not down. running a red light for this, Omari. <sighs> Letting them get away. No, look. They're over the bridge now. Lost him for good. You're the one who told me we don't have the budget for anything. We can't be getting traffic tickets. Omari, why do you want to find out who's in it so badly? What if it's who took Jordan? And what if it's just a van? But you think someone took Jordan? He probably just got lost somewhere in the forest. Just a van? They wouldn't speed off into the forest like that when they realize they're being followed. Look, I... We're on the way to somewhere else right now. Next time we see the van, we'll follow it. Hey. Yeah? We'll find Jordan. Why do you think he got kidnapped? Where else would he be? He didn't fall in the toilet and get stuck. He's gone. It's just that I'm kidnapping. That's a lot. There's a search party for him tomorrow afternoon. We can join that if you want. Oh, we're going. The police know about him being missing, right? I'm sure they're on it. He'll show up. Hopefully not dead. Oh, it's going to be a right up here for the school. When we arrived at the school, Mrs. Robinson, Kathleen, as she preferred to be called, showed us multiple stacks of yearbooks she'd pulled from storage all tucked away in banker's boxes. The building itself was relatively empty, as summer vacation had just begun. Many of the teachers had finished cleaning out their classrooms the previous week, leaving mainly the office staff in the school. While Omari started to dig through the books, I asked Kathleen a few questions. Did you know any of the victims of his? Victims? Is this about Shadow Man? Uh, yeah, sorry, I forgot to mention that. We're trying to find pictures of the victims because we couldn't find them through the families. Well, Ava... I know, I'm sorry. I didn't realize this was under wraps. I apologize for that. Of course I knew the victims. Most of them, anyway. I'm not quite that old. Madison and Ava were always coming over to play. After my kids moved away, the playground in my yard didn't have a use anymore. My husband and I were going to tear it down, but I just remember one morning we looked out and saw these two little girls back there. One was pushing the other on a swing, and when we found out it was the neighbor girls, we decided to keep it so they'd have somewhere to play. Our parents couldn't afford a playground, so it was run around the yard or sit inside, bored and sweaty all summer. You both were a fixture to us. (laughs) And you were great babysitters. You were great company. But as for the others... Nicole and Karen. I knew them both. They were in and out of the office at different points. And they were both good girls. Any distinguishing features they had in common? None that I can think of. Nicole was always hyper and getting sent to the office for being a distraction. She was a little blonde-haired girl with no interest in anything but those little plastic barrettes. She always had like eight or nine clipped into her hair. Karen was the total opposite. She only ever came into the office because she was dropping off a sick note. Except for one time. What happened? Is this her? Karen Cirillo, right? Yeah, that was her when she was in second grade. Now look at the rim on those glasses. Oh my God. the style. <laughs> Keep looking for the others. She came into the office crying. 
Her glasses had broken. She wasn't all that clear about exactly what went down, but I could tell she was hiding something. Did you ever figure out what it was? It seemed likely that one of the other kids were bullying her. At least at the time, that's what I thought. What do you think now? Looking back, it's just... And when we asked her about it, she never told us the name of who broke her glasses. She was buried by the book. Break a roll, face the consequences. Almost too honest for her own good. If someone had actually been bullying her, she would have said something. She said stuff in the past. But in the moment I ignored it and assumed she was covering for someone. Maybe a friend? Why are you opening so many of those, Amari? I wonder if there's a pattern in what age they were murdered at. I want to see them all through the years. So, you think she wasn't covering for someone, Kathleen? Not now. Not looking back. You have to remember, at that point, only two kids had died. And one was on the original night of the fire. So no one took this Shadow Man stuff seriously. But now... Now we have so much more in context. What he did to them. It was all in the papers. We know how he did it. But we don't know how he did it. I mean, smoke inhalation. How do you do that to somebody when there's no fire near them? It doesn't make sense. What does that have to do with Karen's broken glasses? She said Shadow Man broke them. Did her classmates see anything? No. It was in the bathroom. Well, did anyone check the bathroom? How did a strange man sneak into a little girl's bathroom inside an elementary school? I and mean, that's... You should have called the police. You have to understand, it was a very different time then. We didn't think Shadow Man was a real thing. No one was in the bathroom when we checked, so we figured she made him up as not to tell on one of her classmates. But if you had listened to her, the police might have been able to find a fingerprint, something, catch him even. Madison could still be alive if you'd listened to Karen. Well, we don't... A lot of things could have been different if... So, you knew Karen as an honest rule follower, right? But when she told you something had happened to her, you didn't believe her. Huh? What? Come look at this. Oh, no, Finn. You keep talking. I'm just checking something. I don't claim to have done the exact right thing in every circumstance throughout my life. People make mistakes. That day I think I made a mistake. You're right. Eva. Yeah. You're right. I'm sorry. Have you ever looked up the victims in these yearbooks? No. Why? Come here. This row is all of Eugene's yearbook photos. These are Susan in all of her classes. Karen here, Nicole, and Madison. I don't... Hmm. All the other teachers through the years are shuffled. There's hardly any overlap. Except for the one. Mr. Myers. They all had him at some point. Where'd you say you moved to? Wisconsin. Oh, Claire, actually, if I remember correctly. That's barely two hours away from Minneapolis. I was gonna fly into there because it was cheaper than St. Paul International. So Zachary was just a couple hours drive away. And guess who just blew back into town right as the murder drive spell seems over oh, due to end? fuck. I think we just found a victim's commonality. Well, I know who we need to interview next. And maybe these can help find the next victims. There is nothing more exhilarating as an investigator than when the pieces start to fit together. For the first time, we had an actual suspect in mind, and a living suspect at that. Finding out about Zachary's murder meant Keith Wilson's Walter Lee as Shadow Man theory was no longer viable. With him dead a full two years before Zachary Scott visited Garrison, he was not a suspect in the death, and it undermined him as a suspect in the previous deaths as well, assuming they were all done by the same person. But in the moment, that was okay, because we had someone new to follow, somebody we could keep tabs on. Already, ideas of what to do with this new information were whirling through my head. But just because we had someone to watch now didn't mean everything was solved. There were still so many questions left unanswered, so much more to discover. I had to step back, be logical about things, break down what we knew, and move from there. But one thing was clear. The footprints. The fire. The baby. The bodies. Everything in this story circles back to Shadow Man. No matter how I try to push him to the side and explore other options, 
the most plausible explanation always ends up being the implausible explanation of it being the singular person. What is he up to? And will he surface again? Next time on Strange Trails. He is not talking to you, not after what happened. I want to spend the next who knows how long cooped up inside all night. There's only so much research we can do online. Oh my god. Oh my god, what happened? Strange Trails stars Matt Winton as Finn Mitchell, Dominic Kim as Omari Mason, and Ashley Avery as Ava Cook. Additional performances by Jimmy Bacon as Keith Wilson, Alex Petrovich as David Scott, and Kelly Poling as Kathleen Robinson. Created, directed, and edited by Colton Woods. Script supervisor, Fernando Colazzo. Special thanks to Katie Joyce and Courtney Woods. Follow us on Instagram at Strange Trails Podcast or visit us at strangetrailspodcast.com for more info. If you like what you hear, ratings and reviews really help the show. Strange Trails will return in Stakeout. <laughs> <laughs>